I am Hill Craddock. I work at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga in the Department of Biology, Geology, and Environmental Science. I teach biology. I teach mycology, which is the fungi, mushrooms, mold, and yeast. And I teach an economic botany course. I, uh, I'm doing uh, plant breeding with the American Chestnut Foundation. I've been doing that for about 20 years. The chestnut blight was first discovered in 1904 in New York City on chestnut trees at the Bronx Zoo. And they were large old American chestnut trees that were dying and a plant pathologist from Brooklyn went all the way over to the Bronx to look at the trees and discovered that they had a fungus living on their bark. It was an orange mold nobody had ever seen before. Uh, he described it as a new species. Later, that same species of fungus was found in China, growing on Chinese chestnut trees. But it doesn't kill the Chinese chestnut tree usually. It causes a disease, but they're resistant. So it was hypothesized that the fungus had come somehow from China to the United States. We know now that it actually came from Japan. It was imported on nursery stock from Japan, imported into New Jersey and the New York area <coughs> in the late 1800s. Chestnut trees were sold through mail order nurseries and that way the chestnut blight was distributed along the East Coast. It was first discovered in New York City, but it had been present for several years already. It spread very quickly from New York in concentric circles. Uh, it killed virtually every American chestnut tree in the United States. We're talking about billions of trees. This is a pandemic. You know, an epidemic is when a lot of people get sick. In a pandemic, every individual was affected. There were no unaffected individuals. <clears throat> it got to Tennessee in the 1930s, and by the 1950s, the American chestnut had been completely eliminated from its ecological niche as a, <coughs> as a temperate zone forest tree. And it was a very pervasive tree prior to that. <laughs> they were common. Um, they grew from Mississippi and Georgia all the way, and Alabama, all the way to Maine and Canada, so they had a, a large range. They're typically an upland species, not a bottomland species. In the western North Carolina, uh, southwestern Virginia, and east Tennessee, they were a dominant uh, hardwood. Um, there are some, you know, anecdotal accounts of entire forests uh, canopy, you know, and in other words, it was a solid chestnut stand. Um, here in Middle Tennessee, it occurred. It was common, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the only tree in the forest. They were important economically mostly because of the volume of timber. It's uh, relatively rot resistant. It was a good source of tannins. It was easily split. In other words, you didn't need a sawmill to use it. You could just split it into rails or shingles. Um, it's lighter than oak. It has a good strength. It was used for building. Uh, it was used for, for, for many purposes. It's not a fine lumber like walnut or cherry or even white oak. It's a rough sort of wood. So in cabinetry, it was used to build the back or the sides of a cabinet, not the front of a, of a of fine furniture. Um, and of course, it's mostly important for the food that it produced because different from acorns and hickory nuts, chestnuts produce nuts every year. So as a staple food, not only for the humans that lived in Appalachia, but for wildlife, um, every kind of animal from arthropods, insects, and snails, all the way to birds and other beasts, bears. Uh, everybody ate chestnuts. Uh, anecdotal accounts of flocks of millions of passenger pigeons would fly through the chestnut forest in the fall and churn up the forest uh, by the millions eating chestnuts. Um, something that we can't imagine today, the scale and the scope of that uh, destruction is, is, is literally unimaginable. There's no there's no paragon in today's world for, for that scale of destruction. In fact, there's no, there's no example of a forest disease that so completely and quickly eliminated its host. The chestnut blight pandemic may be the worst ecological disaster in the history of North America since the Ice Ages. Uh, the, the, fungus, the fungus only kills the, 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 the bark, but it doesn't kill the roots. And so if you walk in the woods today, you can still find chestnut trees sprouting from the base. And so in there lies the hope that we can bring them back. And the strategy that we're using, of course, is to create a hybrid between the blight-resistant Asian species and the American chestnut. Every generation selecting for trees that look like an American chestnut, we do repeated 
generations. We do many generations. Every generation we increase the proportion of American. You know, we started with a Chinese American 50-50 and then we back cross that to the American, we get a three quarters American, we back cross that, we get 15 16 etc. This tree is more than 90% American. It looks American. The main thing that it doesn't, the main Asian character it has is it has blight resistance. Now I admit this looks kind of pretty, but it looks a lot better than, than that tree, <laughs> which, which is gone. There may be, there may be a dozen left in this orchard from 500 we started with, right? So this was, you know, this was in the 10 best trees of the 500. But it's, it's gone ahead and died of blight. And the susceptible trees, the American type trees, died within one year. This tree has had blight now for five years. They were challenged with blight in 2010. It's 2016 now. So it's had blight for five years. And so this is the canker here. And if you can see this is all dead. It's dead from here up. These pustules, these pustules on the bark, these orange pustules, those are the those are where the fruiting bodies of the fungus are. So the spores come out of there. There's two types of spores. One is airborne, and the other one comes out in a sticky jelly that sticks to the feet of animals. So if a, if a critter walks across there, if an ant or a, an earwig walks across there, it carries the spores. Or if a bird or a squirrel lands here, the spores will stick to their feet. The airborne spores, of course, blow in the, in the breeze. And so this tree, this tree is, is uh, probably not, not one that we're going to use in our breeding program again. We did collect seeds from it last fall, though. So this tree was alive in 2015, and we harvested nuts from it. But this year we, we won't. Of course, it's dead from here up. These are this year's sprouts, just to show you how quickly they can grow in one year from a basal sprout. The American chestnut has this sort of legendary ability to grow from the base when you cut it down, or when blight kills it from the top. So look at that, that's gonna be more than six feet tall by the end. I mean, it's only the 10th of June today, right? We've got another July and August of growth. These may grow 10 or 12 feet before the end of the growing season. Fungus so lives on the chestnut stems and it also lives on oak trees. So the same fungus that causes chestnut blight also causes a disease of oak tree. And so even if all the chestnuts went extinct, the fungus would still be here.